First of all, my name is Sandra K. Hale. I'm the coordinator of this event, Remembering with Honor. We certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, I was expecting a bigger crowd, but we're glad you're here. And uh, be patient throughout the program. And as I introduce people, you'll know who they are from the program. To start it off, I'm going to introduce Dr. Paul Ortiz. He is the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Is a big sponsor for part of this event, and he's going to take it from there. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. All right, I hope everyone is doing well, and uh, welcome uh, on behalf of the University of Florida and the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Uh, welcome to this wonderful program that uh, Sandra has planned from the very inception. Uh, it's titled as Remembering with Honor, One Quilter Salutes the Military and Other Heroes from the War on Terrorism. We're very honored to welcome to our community a remarkable quilter, historian, uh, storyteller, American citizen. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Don Bell to give you. Bring you up now. I just wanted to make sure we. I, I hate long introductions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to refer you to your program. Um, this program was made possible thanks to the generosity, uh, hard work, and creativity of dozens of individuals and organizations. Um, it's and one component of it is this morning's program. Uh, but I think you will agree with me when you look at these quilts, you'll understand that the impact of today's program. Uh, is going to live on both in Gainesville, uh, but also nationally. Uh, please take a moment to, to look at the program sponsors and please give them a warm round of applause for making this program possible. So while Remembering with Honor has been made possible thanks to the work of many, many people and organizations, the Hilton Hotel and others, um, as with most things in life, there has been a, a really a, a single catalyst. Uh, way back in August, uh, Sandra K. Hale approached the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program with the idea for this public program. And since that time, Sandra has worked day and night, night and day, to weave together, uh, pun intended, um, today's event. And she's really been the catalyst for outreach uh, local arrangements and publicity. So please join me in acknowledging the outstanding labors of Sandra K. Hale and making Remembering with Honor a reality. Um, the UF Oral History Program is especially honored to be a co-sponsor of today's event. We are one of the major repositories of veterans oral histories in the American South. We have oral histories with veterans from the American Civil War. Yes, that Civil War. Uh, we have oral histories with veterans from World War I, the Spanish-American War, uh, the Vietnam War, you name it, we have it. We are always in the posture of conducting oral history interviews with veterans. And we especially relish the opportunity to put UF undergraduates in contact with veterans of American wars. Because when you, when you have uh, a student that goes through the University of Florida, it's often easy to forget the histories of World War II, the histories of Vietnam, the histories of Afghanistan, so on and so forth. So we are uh, also unique among oral history programs in the United States in that every director in the history of our program um, has been a veteran. And I was a veteran. Uh, I served in the 82nd Airborne and 7th Special Forces uh, in Central America uh, from 1982 <coughs> to 1986. Our program is founded by Samuel Proctor. Now, Sam was a World War II veteran. He served at Camp Landing. Uh, and I'm so glad to, to see our, our connection to Camp Landing today. Uh, Sam taught thousands of service members critical skills and literacy that they needed to have in order to be part of the modern military service and to win World War II. Uh, beginning in 2010, we signed a cooperative agreement with the National Veterans History Project 
which means that copies of every single oral history interview that we do here with the veteran will also be deposited at the Library of Congress. Our biggest end users of these interviews are public school teachers in the state of Florida. Uh, there's a mandate you may know about uh, that every school teach a component on World War II, but as many things in government these days, it's an unfunded mandate. Uh, and so teachers call us on a weekly basis and say, do you have materials on World War II? And we can tell them, yes, we have hundreds of interviews with veterans, and we can put those interviews in the hands of school teachers, and that's part of our job. The, um, in fact, yesterday we conducted an oral history with Mr. Bell that will become part of our permanent online collections. In order to access these interviews, all you need to do is to log onto our website, and then from there, you can get onto the digital University of Florida site um, uh, to use those interviews. Just a few announcements before I introduce Don, uh, who's founder of the Home of the Brave Quilt Project. There is a sign-up sheet that's going around. Uh, please sign this and include your contact information uh, so that we can give you regular updates about what we are doing. If you are a veteran, and you know of a veteran or veterans who might be interested in being interviewed, please write a note by your name. Uh, and also, if you're interested perhaps in volunteering, a lot of our uh, uh, interviewers are volunteers. Uh, we always need help in interviewing and transcribing and making our materials accessible to the public. So if you want to join our, our ever-expanding family, we would certainly welcome that. Um, also, please take a few moments to stop by the informational tables in the back. Uh, on your way out, there is a table, I think, with uh, Mr. Bell's book on the Civil War. Uh, there's also information on some of the other work of the oral history program. We have a documentary film uh, which is being used in Florida public schools on the Batan Death March. Uh, I want to mention this in particular because we have uh, several uh, conducted several interviews with survivors of the Death March over the years, and we put that together in a film which also has a teacher's guide, uh, which, which allows uh, a school teacher to, to use the film and to ask, have the students ask questions about that particular event. Um, the final thing I'll mention before I bring Mr. Bell up is that, um, as you know, the University of Florida has been the subject of enormous budget cuts uh, over the past few years. I think you know it's coming. Um, if you like today's program, if you like to support the idea of gathering, preserving, and promoting the stories of our nation's military <coughs> veterans, please consider making a donation to the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, either now or in the future. Any amount is welcome. So now I'll refer you to the program uh, for uh, my introduction to Mr. Don Bell, because I'm going to go by the script there. Um, we are, again, tremendously honored to have this extraordinary gentleman with us. Uh, this morning, this weekend. Don Bell is the co-author with Pam Weeks of Civil War Quilts, uh, is one of the nation's leading experts on U.S. Sanitary Commission soldiers' quilts. These quilts, made during the Civil War for use in military hospitals, represent an important link between yesterday's community service quilting and today's. Mr. Bell is currently striving to make a national Iraq Afghanistan memorial quilt with individual blocks for each casualty represented on a quilt. These quilts are modeled on popular quilts, a popular community quilt technique of the 1830s to the 1880s. Mr. Bell has been the featured artist at Road to California, California's largest quilt show, and has had quilts hang in numerous museums across the nation. In 2011, he was invited to be the featured speaker at the American Quilt Study Group Seminar in New Jersey, where he discussed his motivations we're making a series of quilts based upon his thoughts about 9-11 and other terrorist attacks. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Don Bell. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, anytime I can get out of California is good for me. And it's my first trip to Texas, uh, Texas, it was my first trip to Texas too. But it's my first trip to uh, Florida and uh, everybody here has been very gracious and very welcoming. I want to echo uh, uh, Dr. Ortiz's comments about Kay. 
uh, as you probably gathered, I've spoken a lot of times because uh, I'm one of those old men that just thinks he's so charming that you can't, you know, you, he can never shut up. You know, the guy in the checkout line when you're trying to hurry through and he's blah, 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 and you want him to be quiet. Well, that's me. And uh, so I never pass up an opportunity to talk. Uh, and I've talked uh, to civic organizations, schools, uh, uh, churches, uh, quilt guilds, professional organizations, and I've never seen a uh, better organizer than Kay. Uh, the detail that she has put into this organization is extraordinarily impressive. Uh, if uh, uh, one of the political candidates uh, running for president were to have her on their team, I would almost guarantee that they would probably have victory because she would micromanage uh, uh, them right into the White House. <laughs> so once again, thanks, thanks to you, Kay. I uh, am going to give you a bit of information about myself, and in fact, I'm going to talk a lot about myself because that's what we do when we're, you know, so overwhelmed with ourselves. I, I know I sound like an egomaniac, but I'm really not. I'm, I just have a weird sense of humor. Uh, but I, I do want to give you background because it has to do with the motivation for what I do. Uh, I'm not a great quilter. I, I'm a good quilter. Uh, what I am is an interesting quilter, and I think interesting is always better than perfect. Uh, and I have a niche of quilting that is kind of overlooked by, by quilters. It's, it's what I call commemorative quilt making. Most quilters do commemorative quilt making, they just don't realize that they're doing it. Uh, but there is a great history in this country of, of commemorative quilt making going all the way back to the beginning of quilting. What commemorative quilt makers do is they, they remember special events, special people, uh, special causes that they believe in by making quilts. In the 19th century, women did not have uh, the franchise. They were disenfranchised. And therefore, they did not, uh, could not publicly participate in political movements or social movements. And one of the ways that they did this uh, a little bit more subtly uh, was that they would name quilt blocks or make quilts to represent their political thoughts and the people that they admired. Uh, and as a studier of history, I've always found this aspect of quilt making very interesting. Uh, just so that you'll know that there can also be an amusing side of it, it was very popular in the 1870s, uh, the 1880s, to make one of two quilts, one that is called Drunkard's Path, and the other one of which is called a Double T. And women of alcoholic husbands <laughs> would make these quilts and then put them on their beds. Now, I doubt very much that the husbands ever caught on to the significance of what their wife was trying to tell them, uh, but uh, uh, that's what they were doing there. One of the folks that had a quilt block named for uh, them is Carrie Nation. And I'm sure many of you remember Carrie Nation is the lady that in the early 1900s uh, uh, got her ax and went out to uh, smash up saloons because apparently there was a tremendous problem, at least in the Midwest in those days, with husbands spending all their time in saloons and not at home with the uh, wife and children where they belonged. Well, it helps to know what motivated Carrie when she got married at the age of 17 to her first husband over the objections of her mother and father, not that that happens today, uh, she uh, married an alcoholic. Uh, he very conveniently, a few months into their marriage, in a drunken stupor, fell into a puddle of water and drowned. <laughs> uh, but Carrie learned her lesson, so she married another alcoholic. <laughs> and uh, uh, her solution to the second alcoholic husband was to grab her axe and go out and chase him and, and other alcoholics home. That's what I find fun about quilt uh, designs and quilt pro uh, 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 blocks because they show us our history. I think quilters are the folk art historians of our country. Uh, when things happen that we want to remember, we design quilts and blocks for them. It's uh, not as popular today as it was back in that period of time, but in my own little way, I'm, I'm trying to make it more popular. I, I came to this um, naturally. Uh, I did not serve in, in uh, the military. I uh, um, was a precocious child. I'm a precocious adult, too, I guess. But I uh, saw my dad. My dad was a truck driver. And when uh, we, we, I'm from the era when they had suicide doors on cars. And they were called that uh, quite appropriately. Uh, my, I'd seen my dad many times when the door was loose, uh, you know, when we were driving down the road, open his door and, and shut it. 
Uh, and I was riding in the back seat of a, of a, a Plymouth one time with my grandfather, and the back door was loose. So I was four and opened it to shut it. There's only one little problem when you're going 65 miles an hour uh, and you open the back door. It does fling the person holding the handle out into uh, the uh, air, and that's what happened to me. And I landed on my head and had a major uh, brain injury, uh, left me with a seizure disorder. And in the dark ages of medical care of uh, World War II, uh, they didn't even have penicillin until the war was almost over. Uh, brain injuries resulted in bed rest, and that was about it. So I spent a very long time in, 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 uh, in bed, but from that I have had a lifelong seizure disorder problem. However, I come from a family with many uh, folks that have served in the military, and even more that have served as firefighters and police officers. So I have a great admiration for what it takes to both be a person who dedicates their life to service of country and citizen, but even more importantly, a very great respect for the families that stand behind them. Uh, my thing really in starting the Home of the Brave was not so much to uh, honor the fallen soldiers, although that, of course, is obviously what we do. Uh, my thing was to tell their families, who I believe are true American heroes, that we understand and support them in their hour of need. Uh, there is something very magical about the families of the fall, and I have talked to many, and we have quite a few of them here with us today from this area of Florida. And without exception, I have found them, no matter how they feel about the war or what their political fail, uh, beliefs are, I have found them to be dignified, courageous, honorable uh, American citizens. And anyone who thinks there's something wrong with our country needs to spend an hour with the family of a fallen, and they will know that America is safe and sound in their hands. Uh, anyway, because of uh, uh, not being able to serve, uh, I went through the Vietnam era, uh, where I was actually in Haight-Ashbury <laughs> during the Haight-Ashbury days. So I, I am an old, worn-out hippie. Uh, there are some of us still living around. Uh, and I remember very clearly uh, how we demonstrated not only against the war, which certainly is our right, uh, but unfortunately we also demonstrated against the military and the folks that served in the military. I did not want to see that happen in, this con in these conflicts. Uh, regardless of whether or not you believe in a war or don't believe in a war, uh, I don't think anybody really believes in war per se, although we can believe in uh, an the reason for an individual war. Uh, regardless of how you feel on that, we all need to understand that the military are serving our country and not receiving the, the pay or recognition that they deserve. And they deserve our respect. It is the great blight uh, on the American public uh, that we did not honor the returning veterans from Vietnam. And uh, so that's part of the reason why I started Home of the Brave. Uh, commemorative quilt making, I, I, my very first quilt was a commemorative quilt. Um, I took up quilt making in 1992. I had for many years done needlework, cross stitch and uh, 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 needlepoint. Uh, and for those of you who are old enough to remember, I am a Rosie Greer disciple. Uh, and for those of you who aren't old enough to remember, uh, Rosie Greer was a very famous football player from the 70s. Uh, and it, to handle the stress of moving around with his team and the stress of being so famous and stuff, when he was alone at night in his hotel room, uh, he did counted cross stitch, uh, you know, kind of a female thing. Uh, and once he c publicly came out of his closet, <laughs> so to speak, uh, he made it okay for other men to do this. And uh, I have always had, uh, actually I don't anymore, but I used to have a problem with anxiety and uh, stress. I, I was a very shy person, can you tell? Uh, and uh, when I was at, uh, in my 20s and 30s, I had a great fear of public speaking. I had a great fear of traveling. I had a great fear of almost everything. And I'm a retired uh, healthcare administrator. Uh, the last part of my career is spent in psychiatric hospital care, so uh, a moderately stressful job. Uh, when I left the last place that I worked in, we had a guy that wanted to kill President Clinton, 
and a guy that wanted to kill uh, Hillary, uh, and a guy that wanted to rape Chelsea. But uh, you know, but there was just no stress at all. Uh, uh, the uh, stress was really getting to me, and it was becoming dysfunctional for me. I checked into a, a hospital, and uh, I took a stress management class, and learned that if you have anxiety and stress, that if you do things with your hands, physical exercise or labor of some type, it will help alleviate the stress. And so I took up the needlework and, and the cross-stitching that Rosie Greer had made okay. I did not want to do gardening because I don't believe in being outside. And uh, I, you know, I also don't believe in being in the water. I think if, if we were supposed to be in the water, we'd still be fish. Uh, and uh, I did not want to do woodwork because I had a father and a grandfather that were excellent uh, amateur woodworkers. So I took up uh, needlework. Uh, the only problem is, is for those of you who have done needlework, you know that after a while, everybody goes, mm, you know. And I had a, a mother, an aunt, a, a male cousin, and a female cousin, and we all did needlework. And at Christmas time, uh, we would be exchanging these endless needleworks. And after about five or six Christmases of that, it was like, oh, well, thank you. Uh, but I'll put this one in the closet with all the others. Uh, so I did that for many, many years. I stopped doing it in uh, March of 1992 for a very specific re reason. Um, I had a life-changing experience that moved me into quilting. Uh, I had lost two of the four people that I love most in the world uh, within 10 weeks of each other. Both of them had uh, long-term illnesses, and it was a very difficult time for me in which I had to take care of them uh, and maintain my job and be the support that they needed in, in their final life struggle. Uh, one of them died on uh, December 24th, 1991. Uh, she was suffering uh, from a very rapid growth breast cancer. And, um, and she did not want to do any of the traditional therapies. The doctors had told her they would be useless in saving her. All they would do is prolong her life and, of course, create the great pain and misery that those do. And so she chose to uh, pick her own time that she would pass on. My job, and an almost impossible job for those of us who are control freaks, was to support her in her decisions. It is very difficult for us to realize that sometimes when family members or friends come to us with problems, they don't want us to tell them what to do. They want us just to hold their hand. And that's what I chose to do. Uh, I'm opposed to suicide myself, but I, I felt that I needed to sit there and allow this person to leave this world with the dignity that they chose to have. Well, just as she was doing that, my son, was entering the final stages of his battle with AIDS. Uh, he had been sick for five years. He had been in the hospital 70 times in those five years. That averages out to more than once a month. And during those hospital stays, uh, I would go in and support him. Now, it's very difficult to support people with terminal illnesses, which it was in, in the, the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, there's nothing you can say to cheer them up. There's nothing you can do to make them well. Uh, all you can do, once again, is sit there and hold their hand and support them. And so I would sit with him when he was in the hospital and do needlework. You know, and if he wanted to talk, we would talk. And if he didn't want to talk, I would do needlework. Uh, I brought him home just uh, at the end of December for the final second uh, a couple months of his life, and I cared for him at home around the clock except for the eight hours that I was at work. It was a, a tremendously difficult thing to do. Uh, this was a six foot one, 190 pound, blue haired, blue eyed uh, child, in my opinion. He was 30 when he passed away, uh, who when he died weighed less than 80 pounds and looked like uh, a very elderly survivor of Auschwitz. Uh, that's what uh, AIDS did in those days to the victims that lived through the illness. Um, when he died, uh, which was early in the morning, I was there alone with him and his body. And while I was waiting for his home health care nurse to come and pronounce him dead, I had this experience uh, that I prefer to call a spiritual experience. You can call it what you wish. Um, 
in that I was sitting there in the silence of our home, and all of a sudden, I started to have this warm feeling in my body. And a great sense of joy overcame me, which is not, of course, the emotion that you would think that you would have when someone close to you has died. But the reason for it was that I realized in that instance that I had just done what was, for me, the most important thing that I would ever do in my life. And that was that I had provided comfort, love, unconditional love to someone with no expectation of anything in return. I could not save Keith's life. All I could do was love him and support him as he made this journey that we all sooner or later must make. Uh, it profoundly changed me. It made me realize that our purpose on earth is not to uh, make lots of money uh, or become famous or uh, do whatever it is that people think that they're supposed to do. Our purpose in life, the meaning of life, is for us to give to others so that we may help others find comfort and, and, and care. So my community service quilting has to do with that. The very first quilt I ever made was one that honored uh, uh, the folks in my home church up in the Bay Area that in the previous five years had died from uh, breast cancer and AIDS. There were 68 of them, which is a very high percentage of people to die in one church. And what I did was uh, I had taken a 10-week class after my son died. I didn't want to do needlework anymore because that's what I'd done. Uh, so I made one final needlework uh, panel for the AIDS memorial quilt for him. And then I uh, took this 10-week class on traditional 19th century quilting, uh, which means hand quilting, hand piecing, hand applique, and hand embroidery. I do uh, um, and hand, yeah, hand piecing, applique, quilting, and embroidery. I do not own a sewing machine. Uh, the only sewing machine in my family is an 1880s singer. A treadle sewing machine, and I'm not smart enough to run it. I would probably sew my finger uh, with the needle. I frequently put needles in my fingers anyway. But uh, I took this class, which is was a rather long class. Most classes are like six hours, and they think you're going to learn everything six hours. I took ten days, and uh, I mean ten, uh, uh, yeah, ten days in uh, different projects. And I'm very grateful for it because it gave me a foundation. But I, I made this quilt, and what I did is I took a very old pattern that interests me. It's called Blazing Star. It's an eight-pointed star. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with quilting, of course, the extreme variation of this is Lone Star or Star of Bethlehem. Uh, but the Blazing Star, uh, each point of the star has four little diamonds in it. And I took the center eight points, and I made them the same color as the background. Uh, and to me, what was left then looked like a crown. Now, 19th century quilt patterns, uh, pieced quilt patterns, are cubistic. Uh, they're, they're geometric. They're architectural. Uh, there's a school of thought out that perhaps the cubists, early cubists, saw quilt patterns, and it gave them the idea of starting to represent things not as they appear to our eyesight, but as they would appear as if you made them into a cubistic type uh, 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 artwork. So I thought this looked like Job's crown, and the reason I did that was is that after my family passed away, I spent a lot of time reading the book of Job. So those of you who are suffering uh, or, or who have suffered loss, I recommend highly the book of Job, and especially chapter 19, where he talks about how God has stripped him of his crown. Uh, and at the end of that chapter, he says, and yet I know that in this flesh I shall see my Redeemer. Uh, what gets us through the dark hour of that morning that we're sitting there with the body of our loved one or the dark hour after we get the knock on our door uh, is the realization that through faith we can conquer all. That by marching ahead, honoring those that we loved, we will be okay, and we will have a purpose in life that we did not have before. Um, I got involved with the home uh, with uh, the U.S. Sanitary Commission quilts, kind of by accident, and I, I want to talk about them briefly because it, it one of the things that amazed me about Home of the Brave is that so many of the military uh, folks 
are interested in the Civil War. Now, I'm not a, a war buff. I, uh, you know, I, th I think all war is, is bad. Uh, you know, there are victors and losers, and to the, the victors go the right to tell us about the, how the war was. Uh, but if the other side had won, they would have their version too. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that the losses suffered on both sides are very sad. Uh, the Civil War, of course, was our worst war in this country. Uh, we think that today's casualties are mind-boggling, which they are. But the truth of the matter is, is they lost 65,000 American youth at Gettysburg. And we, of course, are not even close to 10,000 loss in Iraq and Afghanistan. 650 million American men died in the Civil War. It was a shattering event in the history of our country. But many military study it uh, for the military uh, maneuvers, but also because of their love of history and country. Uh, out at my home quilt guild in Redlands, California, we have a Lincoln Shrine. It is the only shrine west of the Mississippi dedicated to President Lincoln, and it's a wonderful place to visit. When I used to go in there, they had hanging uh, where people could fondle it and look at it and the sunlight could hit it, uh, a quilt from the Civil War. And I found that very fascinating, and I talked to the curators about it there, and then I started doing research on it. They said, oh, well, this is a sanitary commission quilt. And like many people, I thought, well, what does is, what is garbage collection have to do with the Civil War? Uh, well, it's not garbage collection. The Sanitary Commission was an organization authorized by President Lincoln to go out to military hospitals and make sure they were sanitary. What a novel idea. You know, those of us that go into the hospital today forget that in the Civil War, if you were wounded or injured and went into a military hospital, you were more likely to die from an infection than you were from your wound. Uh, so they were a very dangerous place to be, in some ways more dangerous than the battlefield. Uh, the Sanitary Commission provided the military with its doctors and, for the first time in America, its nurses, its the women. And the Sanitary Commission is a women's organization. Uh, it is the first great women's organization that spread across the North, in, in my estimation. There, there are some earlier women's movements, but I think this is the first great one. And what they did was is they had a commission uh, that, uh, or a board that reported uh, to the Secretary of War. It was comprised of 11 people, six men and five women, because during the Civil War, of course, women weren't thought to be smart enough to organize ever anything. But all of the sanitary commission work was by women. So there were very few men involved in it. And they did uh, t some very remarkable things. They had sanitary commission fairs all across the North in which they would have booze and they would raffle things and sell baked goods and sell homemade uh, items and uh, do all sorts of different stuff to raise funds for the war cause. And then they would donate these or they would buy supplies. They had groups that would sit and make uh, clothing for the military because in those days, the only thing that was really provided to the military was their tunic. Uh, and uh, they would have to bring their own pants and underclothes and socks and shoes and their own guns and, uh, you know, uh, they just did not have enough supplies. Uh, and very quickly after they were founded, they found out that, as is common throughout all of our wars, that military suppliers sometimes don't provide the best of material. Uh, they were given, uh, when they checked in as part of their supplies, a blanket, a wool blanket, to keep them warm out on the battlefield. There was only one problem. It was very inferior wool, and when it would get wet, either from dew or rain, it would disintegrate. So within a few days, the soldiers did not have anything to protect them at night from the cold of the battlefield. A call went out in the North in which the Sanitary Commission asked the women of the North to provide quilts uh, or coverlets for the use by the soldiers. During the four years of the Civil War, women in the North contributed 250,000 to 400,000 quilts to the war cause. It is the largest single philanthropic donation in the history of the world. We could not do that today, I don't believe, even with sewing machines. Uh, these quilts were mostly handmade, hand-pieced, hand-quilted, uh, they, some of them do have machine uh, work on them, but it was probably less than, than 15%. It, 
it is a tremendous effort. And to study that and to look at that is just mind-boggling. Well, as I studied the one at the Lincoln Shrine, I found out that at that time, in the late 90s, there were only four known surviving quilts out of those 250,000. These are national treasures. They uh, were used by soldiers during the Civil War. You don't get much more special than that. And there are so few of them that they really deserve to be in a display case next to uh, the Star Spangled Banner. I think they are the second most important textiles in our country after the Star Spangled Banner. Well, since then, we have uh, discovered some more. Uh, i am kind of become the de facto expert on them. Uh, people will call me up and they'll have this ratty old quilt and uh, they'll say, you know, uh, somebody told me that this might be an important quilt and I wanted to see what you think of it. Now, they're not only important, they're valuable. Uh, there are now 14 known surviving quilts. They all appraise at $100,000 or more. So they're not something you want to just, you know, leave hanging in a, uh, a, a museum where people can handle them. Uh, and after I told the shrine, the Lincoln Shrine, what they had, they said, oh, we knew what it was. We didn't know how rare it was. They, of course, immediately whipped it off the wall, and it's never been seen since. <laughs> no, no, they, uh, my, my home guild made a, 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 a plexiglass uh, thing for it to be behind to protect it from both the sun and from uh, prying high hands of little children. <laughs> or old, uh, old quilters, one of the two. I brought one example. I have reproduced all of the Sanitary Commission quilts. The reason we know they're Sanitary Commission quilts is, is that when they gathered supplies at these fairs and in their regional offices, they would stamp them. Even if it was a pair of socks, they would stamp it with the word Sanitary Commission or U.S. Sanitary Commission or uh, the Vermont Ladies' Aid Society or, or the uh, uh, Cleveland uh, Soldiers' Relief Society, something that told us that it had been logged into their records. And so out of those 14 surviving quilts, uh, six of them, are, seven of them, excuse me, are stamped on, uh, somewhere on the quilt, and we know for a fact that they are Sanitary Commission quilts. The other seven have provenance and design that lets us know that they are the real thing. This is one of the, the quilts that I reproduced. Uh, this is a reproduction. This is not the real thing. Uh, but it's very close to the original. If you are interested in my book, they're all in the book, uh, and you can see how close I came to it. This is the Hingham, Massachusetts quilt. I spent a lot of time thinking, of, and they asked when, in the literature that these quilts measure approximately four by seven feet. Uh, I think one of the men on the commission uh, came up with that size because if there's quilters in the audience, you know that is not a quilter uh, quilt size. We, we would never make a quilt that size. It's a very strange size. But they wanted it to fit on uh, military hospital cots. Uh, for that was their original design, but then they quickly went out into the field because those blankets shredded. Now, one of the reasons they didn't survive so well is that when you would use one in a hospital and uh, you got well or died, they would take the, the quilt and, and, and boil it in a, a pot of lye. Uh, and that's kind of rough on cotton, <laughs> you know, for some strange reason. Or uh, even sadder yet, uh, there was a tremendous shortage of coffins, so they would take uh, the soldier that passed away and wrap them in their quilt and bury them in their quilt. Uh, so the significance of these quilts just goes on and on. But anyway, they asked that they measure approximately four by seven feet. And what uh, I was, have always wondered, and many quilt historians have wondered was, is how did those women make so many quilts? Well. I finally have the answer. My co-author, who's the curator of the New England Quilt Museum, is the nation's expert on what we call potholder quilts. It's a term that she, she coined. It was not used during the Civil War. And what they are is they're quilts that are made entirely of little blocks that look like potholders, something you'd have in your kitchen to pick up the hot pan. So they are basically miniature quilts. And what the women would do in those days, they would have a sewing circle at their church or a sewing circle that just got together or, or uh, whatever, and maybe there were 10, 15, 20 people in it. And the women would get together and they would say, okay, well, we want to make a quilt for the war cause, and let's make 10-inch blocks or, or 12-inch blocks because, uh, you know, 12 will go into 48, 4 by 7 very nicely. Uh, but for some strange reason, a lot of them are 10-inch blocks. Uh, and they would go home then, and they would make 
their blocks, and you can make a block by hand uh, in a day. You can, if you're a good quilter, you can make two or three. So today, they would decide they want 10-inch blocks. He wants to play. Hi. <laughs> they would make 10-inch blocks, and they would get together tomorrow, and they would have 40 blocks. Well, this quilt, as you can see, it has six across, and I think it's 10 or 11 down. In one day, they would make enough blocks to make the quilt. And then they would get together as a group, and they would whip stitch them together, which means that they would sew these two blocks together, add a block, add a block, add a block, add a block. Someone else would be doing this row. It takes about an hour and a half maybe to do that. They would get all the rows done, and then they would put these two rows together. That is how they were able to do that. In one town in Connecticut, in one day, they collected 3,500 quilts. Now, they also brought home their extra quilts, you know, that they had at home. In those days, quilts were what they were meant to be. They were used to keep you warm, especially in Connecticut. Uh, so all the beds would have, th you know, three or four changes of quilts. And what they did was is they kept one quilt on the bed, and they brought all the extras in and donated them to the war cause. Um, it's been a tremendous thing. The way we started Home of the Brave, uh, which was started by, actually by my home guild, I get all the credit for it, but uh, you know I'm always willing to take credit and never willing to take blame. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, we started this because uh, in 2004, uh, just after the start of the, the war in, in Iraq, we decided, as many quilt guilds do, that we wanted to uh, contribute something to the war cause. We had made 9-11 quilts uh, to raise funds for the victims of 9-11, and we wanted to do something similar for the war. So we got the bright idea, because we're not military, there were military people and in, in families in, in our guild, but most of us are not military, that we would make quilts for the Loma Linda Veterans Hospital so that when the wounded from Iraq and Afghanistan came back to the hospital, we'd be able to get them a quilt. And as those of you who are military families know, uh, active duty military don't go to veterans hospitals, uh, you know, because they, they're active duty, they're not veterans. Uh, they go to uh, military hospitals. And the nearest one to where we are out in the desert east of LA uh, is the San Diego uh, Naval Hospital. So everybody went, oh, well, that was a nice idea, but we'll think of something else. And I said to them, I said, now, wait a second. We need to honor the service of these brave men and women. And I don't think we should just pass over that idea. What about if instead we made a quilt based upon the Lincoln Shrine quilt? And this is what the Lincoln Shrine quilt looks like, by the way, is this design. Uh, based upon the Lincoln Shrine quilt, and we give it uh, to the families of the fallen to commemorate the service of their loved one and to tell them that from uh, the hearts of ordinary Americans, uh, we want to go to the hearts of the family and have them understand that while we cannot understand your sacrifice and your grief, we can stand in support and solidarity with you. Uh, and they thought that was a great idea. I didn't know how it would go over. At that time, we had 14 losses in the Inland Empire, which is a, an area larger than the state of Connecticut. Uh, uh, San Bernardino County is the largest county in the, in the United States. Riverside is fairly large also. Uh, and I thought, well, if worse comes to worse, I can make them all. At the very first meeting after that, in August of 2004, a woman in her late 80s came into the guild, and she had two completed quilts. And she said, I made these quilts, one as a commemorative quilt for my husband, first husband, who died in World War II. And the second for my uh, second husband, who has since passed away, who served in World War II. And so I turned to the guild and I said, well, you know, if this old lady can do it, so can you. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, the Home of the Brave is a grassroots movement. I, I have, as you probably have gathered by now, very strong opinions about lots of things. Uh, when my son was alive, we were very involved with some of the AIDS charities in LA, and I'm not impressed. Uh, uh, I know that many people involved with charitable work are doing good deeds, and they are to be commended with that. But unfortunately, no matter how good the intentions of a nonprofit organization may be, 
there is a certain amount of that nonprofit that's motivation has to be in fundraising. Uh, and I don't like that, and I think many Americans don't. If they're spending 20, 40, 60, 80 percent of their collections on uh, administrative costs, then there's something wrong with that charity. So Home of the Brave is not a nonprofit. We accept no contributions from anyone. Uh, there have been a few contributions of supplies, and I think some individual coordinators have gotten uh, $10 here, $20 there. But nationally, we do not support contributions. And the reason for that is, is that I wanted these quilts to go from the heart of a quilt maker who paid for the fabric, paid for the batting, made the quilt in their own time to the hearts of the family. And the coordinators, such as your Florida coordinator here, Don Kuchera, you're also lucky to have her. She's working her way through the United States. She started in Hawaii, and uh, now she's doing North Carolina and Florida. And uh, uh, after she gets through with you guys, I'm sure she'll move on, huh? <laughs> but uh, the coordinators pay all the administrative costs out of their own pockets. The, uh, uh, the whatever mailings there are, the stamps, uh, the boxes uh, that the quilts go out in, the uh, mileage and such that they have to put on their cars to go and deliver these quilts in hand. But I think it makes the gift more meaningful. And strangely enough, uh, so do the government and so does the military leaders. I've heard this time and time again, how remarkable they think that we are not a, a, a charity, that we are actually doing something out of our hearts for the hearts of the family. Riverside County uh, now, eight years later, has 130 plus fallen. Uh, when we started this in, in 2004, we thought, well, it'll be over fairly quickly. But uh, for those of us who have lived through a few wars, we know that is not the way of the world. Uh, I personally thought it would probably be over uh, after President Bush finished his two terms in office. Uh, not uh, because President Bush is a warmonger, quite the contrary, I don't believe he is, uh, but because that's just the nature of the beast. The Vietnam War was not over until uh, President Nixon took over for President Johnson. Uh, what I had forgotten is it then took four years for President Nixon to end the Vietnam War, and we're seeing a comparable historical event with these conflicts in the sense that it's taken President Obama four years to get us a closing date on these conflicts. And let us all pray that that, that date stays true, uh, December of next year. Uh, so some would start and they think, well, we'll do this for a year and then it'll be over. Well, of course, it hasn't, it hasn't been over. To date, uh, the Home of the Brave, with no contributions, has donated over 5,000 quilts to the families of the fallen. What we do is a, thank you. What we do as a practice is that each coordinator is a little uh, dictator unto themselves. Oh, oh. Uh, but I, I want you to know that I'm the master tyrant. Uh, uh, they make up their policies for themselves and their state. Uh, we do ask that they adhere to certain guidelines, the size, the literature that goes along with the quilt. But basically, they can pick their own pattern, do whatever they want. We ask that they be military appropriate or Civil War fabrics. Uh, and so I wanted the quilts to be something that could be used. My vision actually when I started the program was that these quilts would be something that a child could sleep under. And I want to tell you that I was very surprised when I found out that those that seemed to get the greatest benefit out of them are actually the mothers. Uh, although there are some very exceptional children's stories. I had a mother write me a number of years ago that she had two sons, age 10 and 8, uh, who would not sleep at night unless they were wearing a piece of daddy's clothing. Uh, which, you know. And after she received the quilts, and each of the quilts on the back has the name of the fallen on it, uh, they were able to go to sleep with, in their own PJs because they had daddy resting on top of them, keeping them safe. Um, for those of us that make these quilts, it is this sort of thing that keeps us going. Just like the work with my son, we get probably more out of contributing these quilts to the family of the fallen than they perhaps get themselves. 
I made, I made it a policy that even if the family thought they did not, even if we could not get in touch with the family, if we could get them a quilt, we wanted to do that. It's not about us getting their thanks. It's about us saying thank you and feeling good about the fact that we are giving of ourselves to others. But strangely enough, it's the moms. I've had, oh, I would guess maybe as many as 10 moms uh, send me uh, letters in which they have said, uh, you know, whenever I get really sad, I take my son's quilt or my daughter's quilt and I wrap myself in that quilt. And it's as if their arms have gone around me and said, Mom, it's okay. And that is very special for us. Uh, I sent a quilt one time to a, a lady in Arizona who sent me back a note. And uh, she had been very despondent. She was uh, a, a widower, and this was her only child. Uh, and she had sent me a note saying that the day the quilt arrived, because I tend to mail my quilts anonymously, I'm not real good at uh, talking to the families of the fallen, although I have. Uh, I sent her a quilt anonymously, and she said the day that quilt arrived was the day I had decided that I was going to kill myself. She said, but after I got that quilt, because it was four years after her son's death, she said, I knew that there were other people out there that understood and it gave me the strength to continue on. We have no idea when we do random acts of kindness, as President Bush the first called it, uh, who they will affect. But if we truly want to experience the true meaning of life, we need to do those random acts of kindness. Um, the Home of the Brave program is in all 50 states with no advertising, no funding, just by word of mouth, passed from one quilter to another. Quilters are the most giving people that I have ever known in my life. Community service quilting, if one sits and thinks about it, they make quilts not only for the families of the fallen, they make active duty quilts. Quilts of Valor uh, makes quilts for all the uh, uh, returning uh, wounded. Uh, and it's a tremendous program to show them that people care about them and, and their suffering. We make quilts for the VA hospitals. Uh, quilters. We make quilts for fire victims, disaster victims, uh, flood victims, uh, homeless people, abused children, abused wives. Uh, the list just goes on and on. We sent uh, hundreds and hundreds of quilts to Japan after the uh, tsunami. Uh, quilters just want to give. It's something that they can do that will affect those around them. I have estimated in thinking about that, that starting with the Sanitary Commission movement in the Civil War, America's quilters have probably given literally tens of millions of quilts in public service, community service, to people in need in both our country and abroad. It is the longest, biggest sustained uh, public service movement in the history of mankind. Well. Uh, we now have a number of states that have made all of their quilts, uh, and we're all praying, as I am on the quilt for Fort uh, Blanding, that we do not have to add any more names to uh, our list or make any more quilts. And I thought it was time we started thinking about a, a memorial quilt. Uh, as I told you, my son has an AIDS panel that went uh, up to the uh, AIDS memorial quilt. Uh, he died uh, in March 10th, uh, March 12th, uh, 1992, just 10 weeks after uh, the other one. And um, I finished his panel, sent it off, and was fortunate in that I had it done in time for the big show of the AIDS Memorial Quilt in Washington, D.C. in October of uh, 1992 which was a, a, an election year, and they tended in those days to show them. I don't think you can understand how big and moving that quilt is unless you've seen it in, in person. They're no longer able to show it because it's so big, uh, and that they frankly don't know what they're going to do with this. It occupies four warehouses uh, up in the Bay Area. Uh, they're thinking about splitting it up into regional museums and stuff. Well, I wanted to do something like that because I know that eventually there will be a, a memorial on the mall for the, uh, those that died in Iraq and Afghanistan. But until then, we could do something else. 
And I came up with the idea that we would make these potholder quilts where each block, uh, one person could make the block and they could, uh, on the front, put the names of the fallen, their rank, their name, their date of death, where they died, if, if uh, they, you know, some of them have it and some don't, and their home state. And then on the back, they would have individual messages, either about how they felt as they were making the block, or a quote from their obituary, or uh, something that, they, that they've seen, or if they knew the person themselves, they could put that. Um, we started off with the quilt over here, that's quilt number one, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful quilt. There's a couple of very interesting, uh, make them very angry now. Hi. <laughs> There's some very interesting names on this quilt uh, that I like to bring to people's attention because to me, what we need to do when we recognize the, the fallen and the families of the fallen is look to bond with them as human beings. Uh, there's nothing worse than thinking of somebody as a statistic. Uh, but here on this quilt, there is, I think it's this quilt, Sorry, I'm almost blind. It's one of the quilts outside, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a list of the Clovis California Fallen. And for those of you that don't know about Clovis, Clovis is a town of maybe 30,000 people. And they have, at this time, 11 fallen. It's the largest number of fallen of any small city in, in the United States. They all went to the same high school. Uh, which is uh, just mind-boggling to me. But we have put all the fallen across the list there. These blocks were made by the same person, and she is the mother of a fallen. Uh, she uh, made the Home of the Brave quilts for these two people after she got the one that we sent her for her son. And she said, can I make their blocks? So we put them side by side, and she made those. My personal uh, favorite is on this quilt. It's down here is Corporal Billy Gomez, USMC, uh, from Paris, California. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to find the families. Uh, the, rightfully so, the Pentagon does not share with us the uh, addresses and phone numbers of the fallen because as the families here know, uh, they get uh, inundated with folks that want to sell them the magical monument or whatever. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's very sad the way people try to take advantage of other people's grief and pain, but they do. Uh, and so the Pentagon does not give out information. We have to track them down ourselves. And in the early days, that was very, very difficult. The Pentagon actually now gives us addresses because they know that we have no agenda other than to honor the fallen. But it was very difficult in the early days to find the family of the fallen. I had looked for Billy Gomez's family for about a year sent out letters, uh, made phone calls, uh, just about done everything I could. I had given up. His quilt was all done. I had made this quilt myself. It was uh, in a box in, in my home. And one night I got a phone call from this lady who spoke very poor English. Uh, and she said, uh, hi, my name is Maria. I don't even remember what her last name was, but it wasn't Gomez. Uh, and I'm Billy Gomez's mother. And I had been so grief stricken by his death which was a year and a half before this, that I have not opened any of the mail that has to do with him. And I'm just now starting to go through it, and I found your letter offering me a quilt. And she said, I would be honored to have a quilt. Uh, and I said, well, that's wonderful. I, I, I have it already. I want to mail it to you. She says, well, I have a favor. She says, could you put his brother's names on the quilt as well? And I said, I'd be happy to do that, of course. And I asked why. And the reason why was this: these three boys were first-generation Americans, uh, Billy, Joey, and Mark. And when Billy was killed, one of the very first folks to die in Afghanistan, his brother Mark was in Iraq. And his brother Joey was in, uh, up in Washington, ready to be deployed to Iraq. And they were triplets. And I want you to know, to this day, it's many years later now, I still, every night, think about the fact that I do not want to deliver another quilt to Mrs. Gomez.
where Billy Gomez's mother. It's that sort of stuff that really gets to you. The tradition of service in our military families is sometimes overwhelming. Uh, I have a very dear friend who's a quilt historian by the name of Sue Reich, uh, who has one, uh, written a wonderful book on World War II quilts. You should get it for your uh, uh, collection, Dr. Ortiz, um, to honor her father, who served during World War II. Uh, she is, I think, a fourth or fifth generation general's family. Uh, and it's, it's just funny how they, they go down rank after rank after rank. Well, her son died in Afghanistan, uh, and he was a major. And he was the commander of the rescue helicopter that went into Afghanistan to rescue that downed helicopter where they were shot down and all 14 people on the helicopter died. He was a graduate of West Point, a uh, professional class baseball player, uh, just an extraordinarily bright, bright young man who without doubt would have played a very important role in America in the mid 21st century. A terrible, terrible loss to our country. But Sue has dedicated her life to remembering him and her father uh, through her service with quilting. Um, it's just amazing the things that we find out as, as we, we make these quilts. So I'm asking people all over the country to make a block or many blocks uh, in this style. This particular quilt up here, we have up here because it is the quilt number two. It's the Medal of Honor quilt. Uh, we have seven uh, Medal of Honor recipients who are deceased and uh, three who are uh, still alive. And uh, in some ways, I have great sympathy for them because in today's American public, I'm sure that they're hounded by uh, the paparazzi, as the rich and famous like to call them. I, I noticed that the first young man that uh, received the Medal of Honor that is alive was in Italy when he received it and he's never come home. <laughs> I think that might be a very smart move, actually, uh, because the, the press can sometimes be uh, overzealous. I went to the 9-11 fifth anniversary in Shanksville, uh, because I have a quilt that's in the permanent collection of the museum there, and, uh, and have made friends with many of the families, that, uh, of the folks that were on that, that plane. And one of them was a, uh, has become a dear friend. She lives in um, uh, San Diego. Her daughter was the youngest person on Flight 93. And uh, we were at the, the, the public memorial, which was, is up on a hill, and tens of thousands of people up there making noise and political stuff going on, all sorts of stuff, uh, which was in absolute contrast to the crash site, which was a mile, mile and a half away where it was so quiet when we were down there that you could hear the crickets chirping uh, and the wind blowing through the trees. Uh, very, very spiritual. But anyway, uh, uh, they, they turned to my friend, uh, the TV cameras, and they would walk up to her and they, they said, uh, oh, I, we understand that you're the mother of one of the people that died on the plane. Uh, what were your daughter's last words to you? And she said, uh, my daughter did not call me. Her, her daughter was the youngest person in the plane. My daughter did not call me. Well, why? Were you guys fighting? I mean, what a ridiculous thing to say to the family of a fallen. If they were, what business is it is of the media's? Now, they weren't. Uh, but I mean, this is how sometimes their minds operate. And it's really very sad that, that we have come to that. Uh, we are very fortunate today and we'll talk more about this later, to have uh, Florida's uh, Medal of Honor winner family here with us. Uh, although on here, I say Wheaton, Illinois, and I understand that, that that's not correct. Uh, so you might tell me what you would prefer to have on it. To, this is the official listing from the DOD, though, is, is Wheaton, Illinois. We use the DOD listings on, the, on these. And that is uh, Staff Sergeant Robert Miller, uh, who died on the 25th of uh, January in 2008. And up here, uh, for those of you that are not aware, is his Medal of Honor. It, it's a tremendous honor to have you here. It's a tremendous honor to have it, all the families here, but especially uh, uh, the family of a Medal of Honor recipient. If you have not read uh, uh, Robert's story, you need to. Uh, there's no question in anybody's mind uh, that this young man deserved a Medal of Honor. 
Uh, this war, there's a controversy that there are too few Medal of Honors being given out. Uh, and I think I would tend to agree with that. Uh, we need to, this country, start recognizing more acts of heroism and less acts of folly like constant rehab uh, through drug and alcohol programs in California. Uh, the heroes of our land need to be brought to the attention of the public because that's how young people know today how they should model their lives. They should model their lives on the service and sacrifice of our military and not on who has the biggest car, the most expensive dress, uh, or the uh, largest number of rehabs under their belt. But there are the uh, ones that are surrounded in the blue are the Medal of Honor winners. Uh, and uh, a girlfriend of mine made this stylized version uh, to go in the center. Now, if the government should decide, and I hope they do, to award more Medal of Honors, what's wonderful about potholder quilts is that I can take a block out and substitute the Medal of Honor, the new Medal of Honor winner on it. So they're all going to be on this quilt. It's just a question of how many of them there are. There are two more outside that you can look at when you get a chance. Uh, one of them was made by a quilt guild in Northern California. It's the one with the shield and the America on it, uh, which was tremendous fun. Uh, I have 10 of them at this time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, it will take me probably close to 90 quilts to get this done, but uh, God willing, I'm going to live long enough to do this. So, you know, you, when you get old, you always want something to do. My grandfather told me it's always best to die with too much still to do than too little. And uh, so I, I'm working on that. But the other one is very interesting. is for Nebraska, and it has all the fallen from Nebraska on it. And do take a close look at it. The seal in the center of that quilt is hand embroidered. It is not machine work. It is the most incredible hand embroidery I have ever seen. That entire quilt was made by hand by the members of a quilt guild in uh, Nebraska, the Braided River Quilt Guild. And um, I went out there uh, to talk to them and to have a class with them. They pre-made those blocks, uh, and many of them bound them, but they did not bind, they were not all bound. And we met at 10 o'clock in the morning, sat down with these blocks and that medallion, and we assembled that quilt into the quilt as you see it out there in six hours. And that's how the women did it during the Civil War. That's how they were able to make a quarter of a million quilts. They would go home, make the block, come back together, and in one day, assemble the quilt into a quilt. So if you're interested, or you're a quilter, or you know a quilter, I would love to have people uh, uh, contribute blocks. Or what would be even better is if uh, the folks in Florida decided that they wanted to make uh, individual quilts to recognize the Florida fallen. Uh, I have quilts for Nebraska. I have one that represents three of the New England states. Uh, in California, we're doing them by counties because, you know, California has, unfortunately, over almost 700 losses. And uh, uh, we're, I we originally was doing them like back there where they were all just different folks. Now what I'm doing is uh, trying to do them regionally because I don't want to get to be like the AIDS project where we don't know what to do with the quilts. Uh, they'll probably go into regional museums and uh, that way folks can, can appreciate them. Um, the other real passion in my life is the 9-11 events. Um, it is the great defining moment for those of us who were not old enough or born uh, during, uh, uh, on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, the two great remembering events in my life, of course, were where was I when JFK was killed. And uh, I was in art history class. My teacher was refused to let us out. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a rather strange <laughs> reaction. Somebody came in and told him, and he just kept right on lecturing. Uh, you know, and we heard all these people outside screaming and running around <laughs> and stuff, and had no idea what was going on. But uh, when the uh, planes hit the Twin Towers, I live in, in Los Angeles. It was, of course, si 6 o'clock, and I uh, get up quite early. And I was sitting uh, quilting a nativity quilt. Uh, when the uh, second plane hit the Twin Towers. Uh, it's a terribly, terribly uh, sad, emotional, life-remembering event for all of us who, who were alive then. And I resolved, as, as I had done, that I wanted to honor these events with commemorative quilts. And I started a series of quilts that uh, I have made that 
for all of the 9-11 events and for the two other uh, events that I consider to be supreme acts of terrorism in our country. And I want to talk to you very briefly ab about them, but I also don't want to keep you here for Oh, no. I told you I like to talk. But uh, when I do my commemorative quilts and stuff, I like to look at patterns and fabrics and try to make some sense out of what I was doing. This is a Victorian thing. In the Victorian era, uh, quilt makers and people in general, uh, they, they had things that represented stuff, different uh, uh, precious stones or semi-precious stones meant different things. And, uh, you know, that forget-me-nots were uh, something you gave someone that you loved. Uh, you know, they, uh, they had all these different little hidden meanings and their fabrics and their everyday things. So I kind of did the same thing. The very first quilt I made was the one that is at the Flight 93 National Memorial. So unfortunately, it's not here. Uh, it's a, a blazing star, a great big blazing star, surrounded by a border of rolling stones, which is a pattern, uh, antique pattern. And that, of course, was for the immortal phrase, let's roll. And in each of the Rolling Stone blocks in the center, I embroidered the initials of the people that were on the plane, and including at the bottom the husband and wife team that were on the plane with a little X so that you would know they were united in love and united in death. Uh, the second one I made was this quilt. And I want you to know that sometimes I'm a true idiot. In fact, frequently I'm a true idiot. Uh, this particular quilt is dedicated to the firefighters and the police officers who died in the collapse of the Twin Towers. Um, the police and the military are charged with preventing us from having to uh, go or have danger. Uh, the military really aren't charged with fighting wars, they're charged with keeping the peace. Uh, however, the firefighters are the only occupation in which their main job is to rush into danger rather than rush away. Uh, I have great admiration for them uh, and a number of firefighters in my family. This quilt is entirely handmade. It's a very large quilt. It's what we call a California king. It's 110 by 110 inches. It's done in a traditional old pattern uh, in red, white, and blue with what we call terpunto. And terpunto is a technique where you stuff the quilt you stuff behind the, the quilt, and it makes the quilt pop out. Uh, it was very popular in the uh, 1830s on and still is, is popular today. But I wanted to make a traditional quilt to honor the folks that died uh, in the collapse of the Twin Towers. This block that you can see uh, right here, this is, let's see, find a block here, is called uh, Falling Timbers. Now, its real name is Drunkard's Path. Remember the Drunkard's Path? But Drunkard's Path is an interesting pattern in that there are like 10, 15 versions of it, each which has a different name. And this version is called Falling Timbers. It's supposed to look kind of like two logs that have fallen on top of each other. Or you could say an X, but they call it Falling Timbers. I changed it to Fallen Timbers because to me, the police, the firefighters, and the military are the timbers upon which we base our society. No matter how much people like to criticize them, if we did not have these people that dedicate their life to public service, we would not have the security and the freedoms that we have. What I did that made this quilt interesting is, is that I alternated this block with the same block, but churned it 45 degrees. And it allowed me to make this medallion kind of frame for the terpunto of the eagle and the basket and the wreath and things like that. Uh, and then I interspersed it with an uneven nine patch to give it a final design. The inspiration behind this design was that, as I'm sure many of you remember, uh, after the collapse of the Twin Towers those next few days, they showed us pictures. And the one that stuck with me the most was the picture of the grid work lying on the ground and coming through the grid work uh, was the smoke from the fires. So this is my stylized version of the Twin Towers grid work. I put in the borders uh, trapunto words, liberty, equality, dignity, humanity. 
I believe that if all the nations of the world practiced those four world words, we would not have any more wars. It's probably an unrealistic dream, but we can always dream because it's dreams that change the country. The other thing that I did that was fun, and I urge you to come up and look at the quilt, is I put what we call whimsies. A whimsy is something that you put in a quilt that is just kind of fun, kind of cute, uh, kind of different. So when I quilted this quilt, I put the Twin Towers in the border. Uh, I put the Statue of Liberty. Up at the top is a Liberty Bell. I put uh, firefighters' caps, a police officers' caps, their badges. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, I put a flag at half-mast, as well as uh, embroidered in Roman numerals 9-11, uh, so that uh, 2001, so that we would have the history on it. Now, a lot of work. It took me several years to make this quilt. One day, my quilt guild uh, did not have an opportunity quilt, which is w a raffle quilt. So like an idiot, I gave this to the guild <laughs> to raffle off. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I, I like to give away quilts. I, it's part of that joy. So I gave this quilt to the guild. We raised uh, almost $10,000 on it. Uh, I bought uh, most of those tickets. No, <laughs> I, I bought $500 worth of them, actually. Uh, you know, but uh, if you buy lots of tickets, you never win. And of course, it's that old story. The, per the person that won it had bought one ticket. And uh, she, fortunately for me, was a member of the guild. And she has since passed away. And her husband has given me back this quilt so that it may go with the others uh, into a museum. I'm going to have a special show next year at the International Quilt Study Center at the University of Nebraska uh, and uh, from Mar uh, February 12th to the end of July, in which these 9-11 uh, quilts and the Sanitary Commission quilts are going to be featured, and then the 9-11 quilts are going into their, their permanent collection. Well, after I lost that one because I'm an idiot, I thought, well, gosh, I've got to have a version of it myself. And that's what's fun about quilting is you can do the same quilt, but it ends up being different. And I know some of you folks over there can't see it, but you can look at it later. This is the second version. And I did not want to make it as big as the first version because that was a lot of work, I'll tell you. So this is uh, uh, from the uh, Fallen Timbers from the Ashes Heroes. And what I did here was the tradition of quilting in which we did red work. So I have red worked uh, in the pictures and stuff. And uh, including down here, uh, Sirius the dog. Uh, in the collapse of the Twin Towers, the uh, drug-sniffing dog for the Port Authority Police Department uh, was put back in his cage in the basement of the Twin Towers. Uh, his uh, handler survived, but the dog died. And uh, I'm a dog lover, so I, I had to put him in. 403 is the number of firefighters and police officers that died in the collapse of the Twin Towers. Now, when I first made this quilt, the, the borders were the same color as the background. Because what I was doing is, is I was embroidering uh, the names of all 403 of the fallen firefighters and police officers in the borders and in the center blocks. I had the entire top done, part of the side done, when the families in New York, where it's very political, put out a notice saying, please, no more tombstone memorials. In other words, don't put our loved ones' names on uh, memorials. It's a lot easier to hand embroider than it is to take the embroidery out. <laughs> so uh, even though I think I'm the smartest person you'll ever know, the truth of the matter is, is that I'm a little insane. Uh, so I started taking them out and had about 20 of them out. And all of a sudden, I had that moment of clarity those of us who were insane had. And I said, you stupid fool, just take the borders off and replace them. <laughs> so I took the border that had, you know, had the 140 names on it that I had done so far and replaced it with this border, which I think is much prettier anyway. So even the greatest minds you know, don't always uh, uh, quite come up with the right thing. The uh, uh, quilt that's, uh, uh, the, the other quilt that I did, uh, well, I'm going to leave it to last. The other two that are, are, are my terrorism quilts uh, is this quilt, uh, which is one of my very, very favorite quilts. It is called a Spanish rose. Uh, the pattern, the fabrics in this quilt are the colors of the Spanish flag, and it's to observe the Madrid bombings. And for those of you that aren't into 9-11, the Madrid bombings took place on March 11th, 
2004, 911 days after 9-11. So when we think that uh, Al-Qaeda and those folks are just a bunch of, you know, lucky terrorists, uh, I think they plan very carefully. And we have to always be diligent about what they may be able to achieve or pull off in the future. Uh, this was a planned event. They gave that clear message to the governments by the timing on it and the date that they chose to do it. Uh, the center is a blazing star. Remember when I talked about a blazing star? Uh, and what I did here is I stylized it into what I considered to be a rose. So an old-fashioned rose with the yellow center, the red leaves, and then the outer point of the blazing star uh, became the green leaves in the background. And uh, I d so that's the Madrid bombing one. Over here is my Fort Hood Memorial. I think this, the saddest terrorism attack we had uh, was the attack at Fort Hood uh, for many reasons. I think that uh, the, the gentleman that, that uh, did the shooting there is definitely mentally ill. Uh, very, very sad. But uh, what he did was sadder. And uh, like all of you, I'm sure you were shocked. Uh, you would think that when folks come home from active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan that they should go to their home and be safe and secure. And here they weren't. Uh, it's, it just tremendously moved me. And I resolved that I wanted to make a quilt to honor the, the fallen there. There were, there were uh, 13 of them. Uh, and I started this quilt on uh, October, I mean, excuse me, on, on November 6th, uh, the day after the shootings. And entirely by hand, hand pieced, hand quilted, hand everything, I uh, finished this quilt in exactly 30 days. 250 hours of hand work. So that's how long it takes me to make a quilt. The colors up here uh, are the regimental colors of the uh, uh, different units stationed at Fort Hood. I wanted this to look like the Sanitary Commission quilt, and it, and it, and it truly does. Now, they're busy taking off the Fort Blanding quilt there. It's an unsubtle hint. The last quilt I want to talk to you about, if Miss Sandra will get out of the way. <laughs> oh, I can't move it. That's right. We, we taped it down. Is this quilt. It's a small quilt. It's the one I finished last, and it was the hardest quilt to make. It's the Pentagon quilt. Uh, I call this a, a Pentagon garden. For those of you that may or may not know, uh, the Pentagon memorial for the folks that died on 9-11 at the Pentagon is a garden. Each of the uh, losses there has a little area in the garden with a bench with their name on it. And the benches are put in the garden in chronological order by their age when they died. This quilt for quilters is a postage stamp quilt. It's one of the hardest quilts there is to make. This is comprised entirely of one inch blocks, one inch pieces. Even though this looks like it's one continuous piece, there actually are three individual pieces here, a fourth one there. So they're all one inch pieces. And the idea was is that they look like a postage stamp. So I wanted this to reflect this solemnity of what uh, went on at the Pentagon and the way the military is very formal. So I wanted this to look a little bit like perhaps uh, Arlington Cemetery or another military cemetery where we have the markers for the, for the fallen. You start in the garden down here, and you can wander through the garden path and see the ages of the fallen, starting with the two sisters uh, who were ages three and eight. They and their mother and father were on the plane that went into the Pentagon. Um, I like to put special things in, and that's why I did this. So there's their initials and their age. But what's really special about this quilt, other than it took me a very long time to make it, is that there are 2,977 pieces in it, which is the official death toll for 9-11. So that's the sort of thinking that I do when I, I make commemorative quilts. But what I really want you folks to, to take from this is uh, the following, and then I'm going to be quiet. Uh, I've been very blessed in my life that I was able to take classes from two of the great thinkers of the 20th century. One of them was a woman by the name of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, uh, who uh, studied and uh, wrote uh, books about uh, the process of dying, about grief. And her seminal work is called On Death and Dying. I recommend that to anyone who has lost a loved one because it turns out the stages of grief that you go through as you know you're dying 
are exactly the same that your family members go through as they stand beside you while you go through that process. Uh, and it, it's, it's a wonderful work. She's, she was a wonderful woman. Couldn't understand a word she said because, you know, she's German. And uh, even though she lived in this country for many years, she still was German. Uh, and uh, uh, the other one, um, which was even more meaningful for me, uh, was from a, a man by the name of uh, Dr. Victor Frankel. And uh, Dr. Frankel uh, was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud. Uh, he was part of that triumvirate of the Australian uh, psychotherapist before World War II. Uh, he was taken off to Auschwitz in the early days of the war uh, because he was Jewish. Uh, and with him, when he went to Auschwitz, he took his manuscript, his life's work, because he thought, well, I'll be able to work on it while I'm in the, in the camp. Uh, you know, well, the N Nazis, of course, main objective was to dehumanize people, uh, to strip you of all of the things that make you you. And so they immediately took away the manuscript and burned it. And he thought, well, oh, that's okay. I'll get paper and pencil and I can recreate it while I'm in the camp. Then they took away all their clothes, of course, uh, and then they herded them into the showers and took away their names and gave them numbers. Uh, and, of course, they didn't, were not allowed to have papers and pencils. But he wrote his new book in his mind, and he called that book in, uh, uh, In Search of Meaning, Man's Search for Meaning. And what he observed in the concentration camps, that people fall into groups. Some people, when they are faced with a calamity, just give up. They wither away and they die. But on the whole, people in the concentration camp, uh, the, the, both the prisoners and some of the guards, found ways to maintain their humanity and their dignity. They would carve musical instruments out of the, the bunks in their, their bed. Uh, even if you were starving, if someone was sick, there would be people who would give them their food and go hungry themselves. There were people who uh, became very religious. There were people that found a meaning that transcend the horrible world in which they existed. And for me, he said what I think is probably the most profound thing that I've ever heard. He said, there are only two races of human beings. There is the race that chooses to do evil and the race that chooses to do good. Community service quilting allows me to choose to do good. I hope that you all have the experience of a transforming moment in your life when you are able to give to others with no expectation of anything in return. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to shut up because we are going to have one of the more important moments of uh, our event. We're going to call up Lieutenant uh, Colonel Gray Johnson from the Blanding, uh, uh, Camp Blanding Museum and uh, Memorial Park. He is going to read the names of the fallen from this area that are contained on the quilt that we will be giving them to uh, put on display at uh, Camp Blanding. Colonel. I don't believe I need this. Okay. <laughs> hey, before, before I read these names, uh, Greg, you want to come up here? This is uh, Major Retired Greg Parsons. He's a curator of the Camp Landing Museum. Uh, I am the operations officer of the Camp Landing Museum. And I would, on behalf of the Adjutant General of Florida National Guard, uh, I, I take great pleasure in taking this quilt. We're going to take this. I think the intent was to put it in the museum. It will eventually wind its, take its way there, but we'll, we want to move it across the state of Florida. And display it. We right. have we have armories. That's even better. We have armories from Pensacola to Miami. Uh, we want to have it displayed in the state capitol as well. So we'll make sure it finds its way there. But uh, you reference the Bible, so it means I can too. Uh, <laughs> the Bible teaches us that there's no greater friend, no greater friend than a friend that is willing to give his life for his friend. And the names we're about to read off are friends in the state of Florida, great Americans, and great patriots. So when I read these names, the families are here, if, if you can please stand, and we'll, uh, we'll honor you. Uh, Corporal John Rivera, United States Army. Private First Class Jeffrey Warshaw, United States Army. Sergeant First Class Raymond Jones, United States Army. Sergeant Chad Lake, United States Army. Corporal 
Matthew Marcellus, United States Marine Corps. Specialist Robert Blair, United States Army. Staff Sergeant Daniel Supli, United States Army. Private First Cat, uh, Class, Kevin Ellenberg, United States Army. Specialist Christopher Nyberger, United States Army. Specialist Jason Kotrabas, United States Army. Lance Corporal Patrick Malone, United States Marine Corps. Private First Class Don Wayne Vincent, United States Marine Corps. Staff Sergeant Brian Ber uh, Berkey, United States Air Force. Specialist Gary Gooch, United States Army. Lance Corporal Philip Clark, United States Marine Corps. And Private Memorial Tucker, United States Army. Did I miss anyone? Again, uh, you know, none of us do what we do for recognition, for medals, for honors. Uh, and your son would tell these people that the greatest heroes, you know, are the ones who didn't come back. You, you, enough, enough said. Uh, we honor you with this quilt. Uh, I honor you every day when I wear this uniform. So uh, I really appreciate the service of your, your loved ones. And they pay the ultimate sacrifice. Again, they are the heroes, those who come back. We're not. So again, we honor you. We appreciate it. I'm very pleased to hear that you're going to move it across. Maybe we'll stir up some interest in uh, doing a, a state quilts. Uh, a number of the states uh, have made uh, quilts uh, like this for the, the entire state. Uh, but of course, many states have just a few fallen. Uh, in California, a uh, number of years ago, we started a state quilt. And we're using the, the album block that uh, is our favorite block. And each of the blocks uh, has four names on it. And when I designed that quilt and first started making it, I uh, designed it to carry 400 names because in, uh, at that time we had 230 fallen in California. And I thought, well, 170 will cover it. Uh, California now is, is up uh, almost to 700 fallen. And of course, that's the largest number of fallen in the state. So the quilt that I made originally was 110 by 110 inches. And every year I add one or two side panels with another 40 names on it. It now measures 110 by 190 inches. And uh, eventually it will go into our state capital there. So if we make one, uh, can get one made for Florida, we will certainly see to it that it goes into an appropriate uh, Florida building. Uh, we're very blessed today to have uh, with us uh, Don Kuchera. Uh, Don is uh, uh, one of the, the folks that uh, uh, volunteered to help with Home of the Brave. There was a joke among the early coordinators that they would uh, email me after they heard about the program from some source and say, oh, this sounds like a wonderful program. Can I make a couple blocks uh, for the program? And I would look on my list of people that were chairing up the states or the regions, and I would go, well, you know, Don, that's, that's really nice, but you know, we don't have anybody for Hawaii uh, to coordinate things. Maybe you'd like to coordinate Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, quilters are so giving that, of course, Don said yes. Uh, and she is, is uh, like Sandra, she's a, a go-getter organizer. Uh, she shaped this, the entire state of Hawaii up in no time at all. Uh, you even got the governor over there to sign uh, blocks, and uh, uh, they would present the quilts there uh, with military uh, escorts and uh, the governor and uh, uh, make very special events out of it. Up in uh, Illinois, every year, the lieutenant governor uh, has a dinner in which he invites all the Gold Star families to come, and they present the the quilts there. But uh, um, uh, Dawn has since retired. Uh, she was a civilian military uh, in Hawaii and moved back uh, here to Florida. And she has taken over the Florida effort for us. And also, actually, I guess you're living in North Carolina. And the North Carolina effort, uh, some of the coordinators just love punishment. So I let them do many states. Uh, and uh, her mother lives down here. So she's almost Florida. And uh, she has uh, is busy whipping this state into shape. 
she is one of the jewels of the Home of the Brave program. Without her and other volunteers like her, uh, I wouldn't be allowed to come and speak at meetings like this. And our, more importantly, our program would not be the success it is. So she has a number of quilts that she is going to present to the families of the fallen. And I'll turn it over to Don at this time. Thank you, Don. And I want to, um, first, I, my, my first thing I want to say is to thank you to Sandra K. Hale for inviting me to participate in this ceremony. It's, a, it's an honor for me to be here, and it's also an honor for me to share the program with the, the man who invented, uh, founded the, the, the Home of the Brave project that I've been involved with for almost five years now. I'm going to add a couple of remarks to the things that I was prepared to say. One is that Don mentioned the AIDS quilt being displayed in October of 1992. I lived in Hawaii at the time, but I was TDY to the Pentagon, so I saw it when it was displayed there. So, and I have still have the, the reason I know that it was because I saw the newspaper clipping. I did contribute a block to the quilt for the organist of the church that I went to. So to see that the entire, I think it was the last time that the entire quilt was laid out. And it was on the grounds of uh, the, the Washington Monument and the Mall. It was, it was absolutely amazing. My own history a little bit, um, I'm just not going to tell you too much about it, but just my military history. Uh, my <coughs> great-grandfather on my father's side, my mother's side was, excuse me, was with General Lee at Appomattox. On my father's side, my, gra my grandfather fought in World War I, and my dad landed on Utah Beach on D-Day plus two. And I have been, uh, worked with a civilian as for the U.S. Air Force for 31 years. Um, I, so I'm my generation's con contributor to the military, and my nephew's son is a Navy vet. And um, I was a civilian, but I always said, it, you, you know, cut my arm, I'll bleed Air Force blue. It was more, it was a way of life for me. And uh, the military was my family for a long number of years, and that was one of my motivations for wanting to be in this project. Don mentioned the number of 5,000 quilts have been made, and he's talked about Flo uh, California's having over 700 casualties. Florida has 337 casualties to date. It's one of the four or five biggest states. Um, and I do have a little bit more of a connection to Florida. I, do, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. And so I, <coughs> it, y y your home state is always where you grow up, I think. Um, I lived, did live in Hawaii for a long time, but you know, when, when I moved away from Hawaii and I wanted to still work in the program, Florida didn't have a coordinator. So that was just, it was a natural for me to try and help out. Uh, we've now given away over 115 quilts. There would have been like 20 given out when I started. So I, I feel like it's going to, I feel like it's, it's, it's important for me to, to get to do this. Um, I'm here, the reason I work on this prog program is to work with a group of people that I wish did not exist. And that is our, um, our Gold Star families. They are a special subset of a, the country. There's a, there's a relatively small few of them, but they are important in the example that they give to the rest of us, and they've taught their children to serve, and they've shown us how they can continue service, and they on by honoring the memory of their children, of their husbands, and of their wives. There have been over 150 women killed, and some of them have been mothers. You've already met our Gold Star families. Um, I want to thank each of you for coming to this ceremony. I know that probably every one of these is hard for you, and it's the mission of the Home of the Brave Project and me as a coordinator. One is to honor you with our quilts, but my most important thing, and this is the thing that I hear from every single family I talk to, we are afraid that our child will be forgotten, that we are, that after Everybody knows about them when they die, but three, four, five, six, eight years later, when we show up with a quilt that strangers have made for them, they know that their child has not been forgotten. And if you people that are here today, the message that I want you, you Don left, left, left a very powerful message. The, the message I want you to take away from me is don't forget. Remember them. 
every single one is important. It's, it's a big number. There have been over 6,600 deaths, but every one of them is a story. And when you say a prayer, just say a prayer for your fallen. Think of a name. Remember that name. But it is very, very important that these kids, and to me they're all kids because they're all younger than me, that these kids not be forgotten. So what I want to do now is I want to make a presentation of two quilts to two of my families. I'd like to call the Clarks and the Vincents up, please, the families, the, the parents. A couple of the other families that are already here have already received their quilts, and there's going to be a couple more that I'll give out after this ceremony. Who we have up here is um, we have Betty Sue Vincent, and who is the mother of um, Wayne Vincent and Wayne's sister, Julia, and Mike and Tammy Clark, who are the parents of Philip Clark. And I want to introduce you a little bit to these two young men, Phil, the Wayne Vincent and Philip Clark. They, I could have done several things, give their bio information. I could have given you their military information. But what I want to do is give you a picture of who they are from the viewpoint of their families. Philip was a very physically oriented kid, I'm not too tall, but he loved to work out. And when he was going into the military, he would run around the neighborhood with a ba weighted backpack on his back and just, just to build himself up to get ready. He was a fun-loving, loved to be the party of the, the, center, of li the center of things, the, the life of the party. And he inspired loyalty in the people who knew him. After he died, his, the next year on Mother's Day, his platoon mates came to visit um, his mom on Mother's Day. That's the sense of loyalty that they had to Philip. Wayne, and I get this from his sister, was fun-loving, told funny stories, made her laugh till her side hurt. She said that there's only, there's only one or two pictures that exist of him where he's not smiling. And I've seen some of the pictures, and this kid doesn't smile. This kid grins, and there is a difference. He was very, very generous. And before he left on his last deployment, he set her up with her and her children that if he did not come back, she was going to be okay. And with the generosity that he showed her, she got a car, the dream car of her dreams, that she was not going to be able to ever have afforded on her own, and she says she feels like her brother's with her every day. And his thing in life was live today, no regrets. And she said that's her inspiration for how she lives her life. I want to close with a compare and contrast between the two. They both grew up in Gainesville, but the contrast is Philip went to Buckholtz High School and Wayne went to Gainesville High School, so there's a difference. They both were Marines, but Philip joined before he was even 18. He signed up when he was still 17 years old, and Wayne was 25 when he went in, and he was the oldest, oldest guy in his, in his boot camp platoon. The last thing that I want to talk about is a thing that they have in common, and that is a date. The date is May 18th. This was yesterday. May 18th was the day that Wayne Vincent deployed. It was the last day that his family saw him. That was three years ago, and two months later he was killed in July. And May 18th was the death date of Philip Clark two years ago. So even though these families did not know each other before, before these tragedies hit them, they have since become very good friends, and they, you can see that. They've supported each other. And this common date of May 18th will unite them for the rest of their lives. So I want to say to the veterans in the group, the active duty in the group, the families of our fallen heroes, we thank you for your service. This is a Clark, the, the, the um, quilt for the Clark family. Vincent's. It, 
th there's a label on the back that honors, that, that personalizes the quilt, and it said presented to the family of Wayne and of Philip, made by Home of the Brave. And there's a certificate that gives the history of the project that Don explained. So I would like to close my portion of this by asking the gold member fam, the gold star families, all of you here, to rise again and please recognize them. Thank you very much. The other, these other Gold Star families, I'll have your quilts after the ceremony. Thank you, Don. I'm going to let Dr. Ortiz do the next presentation. If you'll bear with us, please. <laughs> I wish I was as smart as Don Bell. Um, many of you have no doubt noticed that throughout the entire program, we've had a very uh, well-behaved uh, police dog. Uh, with us, and there's a very special story. Uh, we're also very honored to have with us Deputy Sheriff uh, Tommy Wilcox, uh, and I understand his family, and I wonder if you could uh, stand and be recognized. <laughs> if you turn to your program, uh, there is a section t uh, titled K-9 Robbie's Story, and I just want to read it for you. I think it's a really special story. Uh, and this is written by Deputy Sheriff Tommy Wilcox from the Latchway County Sheriff's Office. He said the following, My brother-in-law, uh, Jonathan Trana, served with and was a fellow Special Forces team member of Medal of Honor recipient Robert J. Miller. I asked my brother-in-law to ask the family and the team if I could honor Robert by naming my new police dog after him. Robbie is a two-and-a-half-year-old Belgium uh, Mil Milano, Malinois. Robbie is trained to detect illegal drugs, and his primary role is to protect the citizens of Alachua County and the deputies he works with. Robbie is a warrior and has earned a position on the Alachua County SWAT team where he enjoys protecting his fellow team members just like Robert J. Miller. So thank you, Deputy Sheriff Tommy Wilcox, so much for bringing this wonderful, uh, uh, fr uh, we'll say comrade, uh, with us. Uh, we're honored again by your presence. Thank you for the work you do protecting uh, the life uh, of the citizens of Alachua County, and thank you so much to, the, to your wonderful comrade. Thank you. Yeah, would you please come up. And would you like to say a few words, sir? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> would the Millers like to? Would you like to? Don Bale, do you have anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, honored guest, thank you so much for showing up here today. Uh, we're going to close here in just a minute, but I wanted to thank Don Bale for coming all the way from California for this. And those of you who traveled in, thank you so much. 
I hope we did some honor here today, and I hope we can continue to do that with possibly making more quilts. Um, does anybody else have anybody here that they want to honor? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time.